sentinel species for environmental health and has created educational programs to minimize the threat of human alligator interaction. In October 2017, she started her postdoctoral fellowship at NCSU in the Belcher Laboratory and is interested in studying how environmental contaminants, such as fur and polyfuel after substances, influence the health of American alligators and fish within the Cape Fear River. Teresa, can you tell us a little bit more about where you got, how you got to where you are today? Sure, no problem. So I actually grew up in San Antonio, Texas, which is a pretty big city compared to some of the other places that I've um, visited and worked with before. Um, I really loved dinosaurs growing up. I thought for the longest time um, I wanted to be a paleontologist because I just, um, I think like the very first memory I had as a kid was actually watching Jurassic Park and just being so like absolutely amazed um, and just like fascinated. And so instead of a teddy bear growing up, I actually had um, a dinosaur and I was my companion for like a really long time. So I wasn't really too much of the um, Barbie type of playing person, but um, I just really, you know, I liked what I liked and I, and I loved going into the backyard and walking all around and trying to, to find frogs and lizards and everything. And so um, growing up, I had a really big fascination with wildlife and wanted to continue in that fashion. Um, in high school, I really loved a uh, band and creative outlet. So I was a musician and actually really wanted to be a, a music major for the longest time until probably like my first year of college, realizing that even though I loved music, um, biology and science really um, piqued my interest as well as challenged me in a lot of different ways that I, I didn't really experience with music. And so um, during undergraduate, one of the great things that I got a chance to do was a summer undergraduate research experience at Moat Marine Laboratory. And that's where I kind of um, blended the two of working both in a laboratory, so doing some biomedical related research as well as um, kind of getting samples from the environment. So there I worked with a couple of people trying to understand how specific compounds within shark cells could actually help combat um, human cancer. And from that realm, I figured out that I really wanted to go to graduate school. And so I was looking at a bunch of different programs and um, kind of interviewed at several places and after finding one that I loved um, started to do research in the area of alligator health and biology with my mentor that you can see there um, in that red jacket. He was uh, Dr. Lujula and he actually did a lot of research on um, American alligator health and how environmental contaminants within different lakes in Florida could be altering their reproductive health and biology. And so in working with him, um, I actually got the chance to do some international research in South Africa. So I did a little bit of my um, field work uh, catching Nile crocodiles in Kruger National Park and other areas in South Africa and developed some uh, novel assay markers to, to try and determine um, if specific metals from different mining areas could be um, actually causing this disease of inflammation within the fat tissue. And so um, that was a majority of my PhD work, working with Nile crocodiles as well as some fish samples. And now I've kind of continued that at NC State, um, really within the same uh, realm of trying to understand how things that we put into the environment, so not naturally occurring uh, contaminants, um, how that could be influencing the health of an ecosystem through looking at this kind of top-down lens of trying to assess the health of predators. So yeah, that's a pretty long story, but that's where I am now. Um, so really, I've just kind of moved up, so, um, up the East Coast. So I started in Texas, where I have never seen snow in my life before I moved. <laughs> it's actually snowing here today, which is so uh, fascinating to me. I, I built my first snowman, so that was really fun. <laughs> and so uh, then I traveled to Charleston, South Carolina, where, I, oh, actually, sorry. During undergraduate, I did a internship at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. And then afterwards moved up the coast to, to Charleston, South Carolina 
and did my PhD work. And now as a postdoctoral scholar at NC State, I'm working in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I'll just keep on moving up. But I do think that maybe Raleigh might be the place I call home just because it's the one that I could handle the winters the most. <laughs> I am I am very much a um, cold-blooded animal. Sometimes I I, I like uh, I like heat. Um, so this is probably the the most winter I could have. <laughs> so yeah, this is um, I think one of the the really great things about um, doing research in the STEM field is that you get the chance to travel the world sometimes when you. Um, work on different projects. And so one of them, I got the chance to take a first international trip for me to uh, South Africa, which is a, definitely a bit of a culture shock. And went over there, spent about six weeks um, kind of working in the bush, uh, capturing Nile crocodiles with a great group of people. Um, and yeah, had a, had a fantastic time. It was such an eye-opening experience and just a really uh, great, um, thing to do as as a young person just to get the chance to experience different cultures um, that was really um, that was amazing so I highly recommend traveling if you get the chance um, just because it can it can definitely open up your worldview and so now what I'm studying is uh, basically these things called perfluoral uh, alcohol and per polyfluoral uh, acids and so what these things are is that um, they are actually structurally similar to lipids that we have in our body. However, um, they are man-made chemicals. So things like in your nonstick pans or your um, water repellent gear or your water repellent carpet, um, those are the kind of things that are, are used to, to um, very clearly make those um, basically water repellent gear. And so um, what I'm really interested in is this concept of one health, one environment. So what can we learn from species like great white sharks or American alligators or even bumblebees? So what are, what are some things that we are seeing in the environment that could tell us one, how healthy the environment is, but two, um, how can things that we're putting into the environment affect us? Um, and so once you start to see all of these things happen in multiple different species, um, you can bet that there's something probably going on with us as well. I mean, we're not anything special, just another mammal. <laughs> and so I'm going to show you a quick video of basically how we do this process. Um, so you know, we don't, we can't just um, order alligators from, you know, a, a Amazon and get them shipped to the lab and, you know, kind of do all of our experimental analysis. We actually work on wildlife. Um, so one of the things that we do, and I guess we're having trouble playing it right now, <laughs> but um, let me see if I can still, so one of the things that we actually do is go to several sites within um, the different watersheds in North Carolina, and we'll, we'll work on capturing these alligators um, in their natural environment. We'll take a really quick blood sample, so kind of like a vet check for when you take your dogs to the vet. So we're right now we're working on the Cape Fear River as well as the Lumber River. And so um, opposed to working in the lab, you know, you don't have these very specific um, model organisms where you can, you know, dose animals with a certain chemical and see the reaction. Um, one of the things that we like to use in wildlife populations are kind of reference sites. So we know within the Cape Fear, based on some water sampling uh, data from collaborative labs, that there are high levels of these specific perfluorinated compounds. Um, you know, kind of using our detective work, we found that there isn't really in the Lumber River watershed. And so we're kind of using this comparison to try and understand how animals living in the Cape Fear River might be altered um, health-wise with this increased contamination. 
And so um, one of the great parts about my job is that we get to do a lot of community outreach right when we're working up the alligator. Um, so as you can see in one of the pictures at Greenfield Lake, um, there's a lot of families around there. And so when we capture the animals, sometimes they get really interested. And if the uh, parents are so willing, um, they'll let the, the, uh, the kids come and see what we're doing. After we have the animal secured, of course, we're not just gonna <laughs> let them all willy nilly uh, walk around. So this young man was helping me actually um, measure that foot of the animal because we take, along with a quick blood sample, we'll get a good indication of the body condition through doing a lot of different measurements. And so he's helping me uh, measure that foot right there. And then um, we actually had the chance to see some babies this year. It was really great. So. Um, uh, alligators within North Carolina will typically nest in like mid to late June and then their babies will hatch out about um, late August, early September. And this last time while we were working, we actually got to, to see a, a nest. And so that was really great because um, <laughs> we got to, to uh, kind of count the babies and see how they were doing. And just, we didn't take a blood sample from them because they're too small, but we got to just, you know, see what their health was like and see how mom, mom is in the picture right there. She was not happy with us, but we put all the babies back. So she was happier later. <laughs> So yeah, um, one of the unfortunate things that we're finding, and we just actually published a, a study in a journal recently kind of depicting how um, fish in the Cape Fear River system had really high levels of these perfluorinated chemicals within their blood and how that was associated with um, basically altered health endpoints within their liver and immune system. Unfortunately, we're seeing the same thing in American alligators. And so um, what we're observing there is very characteristic of an altered immune um, activity within these organisms. And so um, the tough part about wildlife is like you can't, you can make these associations with different chemicals and, and kind of tease that apart, but you're really working in a mixture scenarios uh, system. So there could be anything from heavy metals to increased harmful algal blooms. And so though we know that there are increased perfluorinators at the site, one of the things that we're doing now is kind of um, basically doing a lot of checklists and saying, okay, well, here we have this, and then we also have mercury. So how does this all fit together in this big puzzle? And so that's what we're currently working on now. And so, as I'd mentioned before, we did uh, actually do this again in fish. Um, so we caught striped bass with uh, fish and uh, NC wildlife. And so they got us a ton of samples in a very short amount of time. I am so um, happy that we work with these, these groups because honestly, science is such a collaborative effort. You can't do everything on your own. And so the more that you get to collaborate and meet new people, um, the better that you become. So I, I got the chance to learn how to actually take blood from a fish because I'd never uh, learned that from, uh, I only know how to do it from an alligator. So that was really helpful. And so uh, we just published that study and we're actually working now to try and determine whether or not um, these levels that we're finding in the fish could actually be transferred to the fish embryos. And if that can be impacting their um, basic ability to, um, to float on the water surface because they need to be able to do that to hatch. And so that's what a graduate student in our lab is working on now and she's doing a fantastic job. <laughs> And so, yeah, um, I'd be happy to take any questions or anything that we would like to talk about. Yeah, perfect. So we've got a couple of questions that have come through on the chat. Great. The first one is, how many alligators do you think we've caught so far? Um, oh, this is a great question. I actually had to uh, calculate this the other day because, um, so alligators are protected species in the US and, and so you need to um, basically have a permit to work with them. And so um, all the alligators that I've caught within my career at graduate school and now is a 532. My, my, um, my colleague, Matthew, he's actually been working with alligators for probably close to 25 years now, and he's at over 5,000. <laughs> yeah, and that's just American alligators. We, we have done some work on Nile crocodiles, and then we're traveling to Belize in the next two months to go work on American crocodiles. That's so cool. What's the biggest alligator you think you've seen so far? 
The biggest alligator that I've seen, I think we've measured um, just over 12 feet. And then the biggest Nile crocodile that um, we've worked with has been about 15 and a half feet. So they're, they're, pretty, uh, they're pretty big when they get up there. Uh, the interesting thing about alligators and crocodiles is that for every foot of, of total length that they have, they actually almost double in body girth. And so a 10 foot animal is very different from an 11 foot one where you could probably need a lot of help to get on land because they are quite fat. <laughs> <laughs> Chubby chubbies. <laughs> Someone else asked, have you ever been bitten? No, I haven't. Um, I actually actively try not to be bitten. Um, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah, crazy, right? <laughs> I do have all my fingers and toes. Um, when we used to do some baby studies, um, when we used to like catch them out and have them like hatch out, um, it, it's really cute. So they'll they'll come out like kind of burst out sometimes of the egg. And so I had one burst out of the egg and bite me on my finger and then do like a little death roll. And they don't have like teeth at this point. They're they're just like little like um, 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 like little gummy ones. And so he was just like death rolling. And I, and I just looked at him. And I was like, oh, buddy, you're going to make it. You're a fighter. <laughs> He's like, just hold on a second. I will bring you down. It will happen. I know. And and it's so funny because that was actually, so we were, we were hatching them out to go release. And so I think it was three years later, we actually caught one of his siblings again. And he was pretty feisty. <laughs> I think it's just that that uh, clutch of eggs. It was just all feisty. <laughs> in the batch. <laughs> yeah. Um, did someone else ask to decide? Yeah, so um, I've worked on sharks before. We actually had a project going with great white sharks um, where we were trying to assess pollutants within uh, the, the Cape Town area um, through using smaller shark biopsies. So I got the chance to do some cage diving there and that was really fun. Um, I haven't worked with really anything cuddly yet. My, my parents aren't too happy about that. They keep on trying to, to say, oh, why don't you go try to work with bunnies? Like, oh, those, those mice aren't that bad. Look at them, they're so cute. Honestly, I, so in the Belcher lab, um, I started as a postdoc and when I, when I first started, we didn't have the alligator project quite working. So I was actually doing some, some my studies, um, trying to, you know, gain some skills in that and quickly realized I am terrible at it. I have been bitten by so many mice and I just think it's very funny that I have been bitten a lot of times by, um, mice, but never by an alligator. <laughs> I feel like it would almost be worse. Like their teeth are so small and sharp. Oh, they are. I have I have so many scars from them. They're they're terrible. I was like, I'd, I'd rather be bitten by an alligator. <laughs> okay, and the final question for this round is um, you were mentioning a lot of the substances you were working with that were causing adverse effects in the environment. Someone says, what can people do to stop these harmful chemicals from getting into the environment in the first place? I do think. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of, of of ideas of you know what is actually needed. So, what are essential use of these compounds? Um, do we really need them in our carpets? Do we really need them in our rain repellent gear? I mean, we were getting around fine before them. Um, I think we need we as a society need to to try and understand um, better about what is actually needed from from these specific chemicals, and and how we can reduce um, our our, um, our personal exposure to them too. Awesome, so we'll move back onto the slide. So let's talk about some realities for instance. How much can someone in your sort of field expect to make? So um, yeah, we don't, in the STEM field, you don't, um, make as much as you would say, you know, like in computer science or, or in other things. So biology is a little bit less salary. Um, I like to say what we don't get in salary, we actually get in experiences. Um, and so I've had so many tremendous experiences of being able to travel internationally, present my work, um, do research with an, an incredible array of colleagues. Um, and so you know, the average assistant professor salary um, for the U.S. right now is about 67000 um, That does change, like, once you get, you know, higher into your career, and then you're, then you're making quite a bit more. Um, but starting off, it is a little bit lower. That's all good. 
kind of the yeah, I definitely agree with what you say where you know, you may not get as much for salary but you you know, how many other people can say they've been bitten by a baby alligator. <laughs> or you know be able to to come to work to every day and and really research what you want to do as well as like ask some some questions that you're you're truly interested in and that you want to go to work you know there there are hard days like anything else but um at the end of it I still absolutely love what I do that's, that's a good good way to go <laughs> So here at Earth Echo, we believe that we can act now for a sustainable future. Um, can you tell us how your career contributes to that sustainable future that we're working towards? So I really want to work towards a sustainable future for all. You know, I, I think um, as much as, as we harp and we really try and understand, you know, the, the effects of these contaminants on humans, um, a part of my research and a part of what I, I like doing is trying to understand what we're doing to wildlife, because um, I truly believe that we can't have a sustainable future without them. Like we, we have really, you know, depleted this planet of its resources. And so we really need to work to be better stewards for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any words of advice for any students out there who might be watching? Um, you know, really follow your passions. If, if you think or, or or even have an inkling that you're interested in biology or chemistry or anything, give it a shot. I know it can seem really intimidating and, you know, professors can definitely seem really intimidating once you, you know, are, are trying to work with them and trying to get to talk with them, but just be persistent and, and realize that even though you're, you're not, you know, doing something right now doesn't mean that you can't be in the future. And what do you think the one thing is that you wish you'd know back in high school? Um, <laughs> in high school, oh, I wish that I would have, um, gosh, what, what do I really, I wish that I wouldn't have started off as a music major. <laughs> I got, I'd gone straight into biology. <laughs> um, it would have saved me, a, you know, a little bit of money in college and as well as some time. But um, yeah, I would have told myself like, hmm, you don't really have a future there. Why don't you try something else? <laughs> Not that you don't in music, just I didn't. I, <laughs> I don't think, it, yeah. <laughs> Um, another question. Have you ever had to overcome any challenges professionally and how did you, how did you handle them? Yeah. Um, so I actually, um, my mentor who I was really, really close with in graduate school actually passed away during it. Um, and so that was, um, one of the toughest things I think I'd ever, and, and still to this day have ever gone through just because, um, he was really like my Dumbledore, you know? <laughs> I know this is like a Harry Potter reference and totally just silly, but he, he was, he was like an, an incredible mentor to me. And the loss of him during that really formative period in my graduate career was really hard to get through as well as navigating how to finish without him. Um, but I think staying strong and having a community of, of students that are really just, like the people that you meet in graduate school and the students that you surround yourself with and the people that you surround yourself with can really um, help you in the future because they're going to be your rock. They're going to be your support system when things get hard. And so I was really lucky to have um, an incredible group that I still hang out with today. We're actually uh, going to have a lab reunion in, in April. And so that's going to be awesome. Um, but definitely, um, yeah, it, there are going to be a lot of challenges in graduate school, but what you can do to set yourself up is create a great community and and be able to like talk with them about anything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one question personally, do you prefer the lab work, the field work or writing things up and presenting them? Definitely field work. Oh my gosh. Winter <laughs> is so hard for me because we, you know, we can't go and catch 
skaters when it's snowing. It's a little <laughs> hard for us. So uh, right now I'm, I'm riding a lot and in the lab. I, I do love the lab work, especially, um, so I do a lot of analytical chemistry at the EPA in a collaboration collaboration with them. And so I, I really enjoy um, being able to, to get on the instruments there and, and kind of feel like I'm in CSI, just like, you know, plugging things around and everything. <laughs> I'm not, I'm actually doing something a lot different, but it's, it's really fun. Um, the field work by far is my favorite though, just because, you know, who doesn't want to we like to say a bad day out on the boat is better than a good day out in the office. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> no. Oh, someone's at the door. Sorry. <laughs> Give myself a beat try. <laughs> it's all. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've got one more question coming in. Um, so why did you pick toxicology as your field of study? Sorry. <laughs> um. I picked toxicology because I think I got really fascinated by it in graduate school. Um, so I was just really fascinated. So a, a, a lot of people, you know, like to go into the let's create therapies or let's create something for a disease. I'd really wanted to understand how is that disease even happening? Are there things that we can do to prevent this so that in the future, like that doesn't happen? Because um, I think it's a little bit of balance of both. Absolutely. Um, and another question is, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, hopefully never having an alligator bite. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. I think um, right now I'm kind of at that stage where I need to be a little bit more flexible in what I choose. But to be honest, I would just love to be um, doing the research that uh, makes me want to show up every day. And if you weren't um, working with big bite things, what species would you be working with? If I wasn't working with big bitey things, what species would I be working with? Uh, oh, I don't know. I really like bitey things. <laughs> uh, let's see. Are koalas bitey? Are they, they're pretty bitey too? Okay, wait, Not okay, bite. I'm trying. More scratchy. <laughs> More scratchy. Um, oh. I really, really love tigers too, even though I know they're bitey. Um, so I got to work at a wild animal orphanage in high school and there was this tiger there that was just like the sweetest guy. He, he was an ex-circus tiger. And so, you know, he wasn't, um, he, he couldn't like walk properly, unfortunately, but he was just, he was so sweet. And so, yeah, tigers definitely. Although I'm actually like, this is going to sound funny. I'm actually really terrified of primates. I think that's fair. Chimpanzees are pretty, I feel like they're terrifying because they reflect us like humans in so many ways. And we just look at them and we are. They're, uh, they're very unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> and last question. Um, did you struggle with any high uh, subjects in high school? Yeah, um, I've struggled a lot with um, geometry. Um, and let's see what else. What else was I really bad at? Uh, English, I wasn't fond of it. I didn't love um, like reading Shakespeare or anything like that. It just wasn't my favorite thing to do. And I am absolutely terrible at geography. Like so bad that I thought New England was a state, not a group of states. <laughs> my, my PhD mentor used to tease me all the time saying like, oh, we're going to go to New England. Where's the capital? I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one thing that I never understood was why Washington DC wasn't in Washington state. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, anyway, I just want to thank, say thank you so much for an amazing presentation and for all your advice. Um, and I just want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in and a big, big thank you to Dr. Teresa for joining us today. You can keep thank you, guys. And feel free to follow her on social media. Um, so Ethico invites you, Ethico International invites you to join us for all of our new exciting programs from expeditions to water challenge to STEM Explore, which is part of the event that we have today. And lastly, we are so excited to announce a brand new program from Earth Echo International 
tackle the Power Echo Challenge. So let's go play a quick video. Power Echo Challenge, and it's a new way for students to protect biodiversity and get the funding to do it. The Our Echo Challenge empowers teams of middle school students to explore their community, identify threats to local species, and then submit an idea for a project that will help to restore a healthy ecosystem. Ten finalist teams will join Earth Echo International in Washington, D.C. to present their ideas, and the top three teams will be awarded grants to turn their project into a reality. Go to OurEchoChallenge.org and join our STEM competition by submitting your plan to change the world. Exactly, so visit www.earthecho.org to submit your plan for the world. And the deadline for submission is March 22nd, 2020. Be sure to stay connected with Earth Echo on our social media channels and website on the next slide. And we, as we want to say a special thank you to the National Biodiversity Commission and the students and teachers tuning in for inviting us to be a part of this tremendous event. On behalf of Earth Echo International, we'd like to say thank you for joining us and keep exploring.